let's start off by using Snell's law right here. And I boxed in the indexes of refraction, those n values, because we need to expand our understanding of that for a moment. Recall that the index of refraction is simply how much a light wave is slowing down in a different medium. And we write that the index of refraction is simply the speed of light divided by that velocity in the new medium. So C over V is what we denote as the index of refraction. And we denote that with the letter N. So we'll go ahead and make that substitution right there. So we have the speed of light over the first velocity times the sine of the first angle is equal to the speed of light divided by the second velocity times the sine of the second angle. Now we'll go ahead and cancel the speed of light on both sides so that we get a more reduced equation of sine theta 1 divided by the first velocity is equal to the sine theta 2 divided by the second velocity. Now since we're dealing with total internal reflection we'll have this first angle right here be what's called the critical angle and the refracted angle theta 2 will be 90 degrees. Now we know that sine of 90 is simply 1 so we'll take this form right here and we'll simplify it into this We'll say that the critical angle is equal to the inverse sine of the first velocity divided by the second velocity. And if we plug in the values that we were given, we'll get a critical angle of 10.7 degrees. Now for part B, it asks, in which medium must the sound be traveling in order to undergo total internal reflection? Now, the sound must be traveling in air. And the reason why is recall that sound is created from a difference in pressure. So the air will have areas of low pressure and high pressure. So sound has to be traveling in air so that there's a pressure difference so that it actually produces any sound. Otherwise, if it were traveling in some other medium, we wouldn't have any sound waves being produced. Part C is a little bit trickier, but we need to give one piece of evidence or we could refute the statement of a bare concrete wall is a highly efficient mirror for sound. So picture this scenario for a moment. You have on this side, we have air. You're standing on right over here and you have a concrete wall. Pretend that you were to clap your hands or if you want to be more creative, you're yelling at the top of your lungs so that you're creating these pressure differentials and you're creating a sound wave. Now the sound wave has energy and not all of the energy is going to be transmitted through the wall. So recall that a sound wave, just like any wave when it encounters a different medium, it'll either get reflected or it'll be transmitted. So the wall is dense enough and it'll simply contain the sound energy and reflect it back. And this is because the energy simply cannot disappear. Not all of the sound is going to go into the wall. So if it's not going into the wall, where's it going to go? The sound energy simply can't disappear. So the wall will simply reflect back this acoustical energy. And that's how we get this mirror in a sense. So it gets reflected back. So we hear that echo. But to simplify it all in words, we can say most of the energy gets re redirected back. So at almost all angles, a concrete wall reflects sound.